Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, and today we're going to be talking about how the unsolicited participation of our unconscious makes free will impossible. Okay, um, before we begin, I want to just talk a bit about why I'm doing this show, what, what the relevance of this topic is to our lives, both personally and, um, and globally. Um, since civilization, before civilization, we've had this idea that um, what we decide, our moral decisions, every decision in our life is completely up to us. And this is what we refer to as free will, that our will or volition is free of factors, um, events, circumstances that, that would otherwise compel our um, behavior. And upon examination, as early as the Greeks, it's, it's kind of been understood um, rationally that, that this, this idea of a, f of, of a will free of that is just, you know, basically impossible. Um, and, we're, you know, we've gotten into that in various episodes. We'll get into that a bit more in this episode related to the unconscious. And, um, and so that the alternative is that we have a causal will. Causal will means that our volition, what we decide, how we decide, our every action, thought, feeling, is caused. It's caused by something in the past. It's caused by um, our genes, our, um, our personality, our past learning, our upbringing, our experiences. <coughs> and in this case, the, uh, the unconscious. I'm, I'm laughing because, like, I just got back from, um, from a break after having taken two, um, taped two episodes earlier today, and <laughs> my decision, which I, you know, went into uh, in one of the shows, was whether to go to the library to browse through s um, some books on Egyptian art or to the mall and get some coffee. <laughs> and, and the thing is, like, I actually did both. You know, I, I took a trip. Um, First I was at the library, then I, before coming back to the studio, I went to the, to the mall for coffee. And the funny thing is that I don't, I don't drink coffee. <laughs> I don't um, drink caffeine, you know, I just don't uh, for whatever reason. And, uh, but I decided, you know, I was feeling a bit tired, um, you know, earlier today. So I decided, well, you know, why don't I do this? And so, like, I'm, I'm noticing <laughs> as I'm talking, it's kind of, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the effects of the caffeine, which is really another kind of... Um, explanation, demonstration of, you know, my will not being free. Because, you know, if I'm trying to talk in a way that wouldn't reflect that feeling or that effect of caffeine, it would be pretty impossible. Anyway, all right, so, so that's basically, you know, you know and, and the reason I'm doing the show is like because, you know, hopefully by transcending this illusion of free will, we can create a kinder world, a, a more compassionate and understanding world. The, the idea behind this is that, for example, let's say you have a toddler, okay, and a toddler, let's say, will do something wrong, you know, spill a glass or whatever, you know. And, you know, we, we, we say to ourselves, well, you know, the toddler couldn't have done any, known any better. You know, we don't blame the toddler. We, we hold the toddler innocent because, you know, because, you know, a toddler wouldn't know any better. They just, you know, they don't know. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't ascribe free will to them. That's the thing, especially, you know, like, let's say a six-month-old or, you know, a younger um, infant. So because of that, we will treat that infant with much more understanding, much more compassion. And when we translate that same kind of way we treat that infant to others and to ourselves, you know, acknowledging that e even as adults, we don't have any more of a free will than the child did at, at six months, then we can um, create a world that's much more intelligent, much more understanding, much more compassionate, you know, and, and they're therefore much more pleasant, you know, for everyone. Okay, so now this, in this episode, we're going to explore how, you know, our unconscious, we, we all have an unconscious, is constantly involved in every decision we make, you know, and we can't help it. It's like its participation is unsolicited. We don't ask it to, to work. We don't even know, you know. We can't, like, the reason we term it the unconscious is because we're not conscious of it. It works, and we, we've determined that we have one through various means, some of which I'll go 
ensue later in the program. But, um, but the idea is that this, yeah, this, this unconscious never sleeps. It's, it's always active. It's, it, it retains all our memories, um, what we've learned, just all, all our thoughts, just our experiences are, are retained in, in, in various um, neural networks. And, um, <laughs> and so like it is taking part in every decision we make. And um, before I get more into that, I want to just describe how, because it takes part in every decision, that, that would make free will impossible. And the idea is like in science, in reason, there is this idea of causality, that, um, that nothing is uncaused. There's always, if something happens, there's, <laughs> there's a reason why it happens. There's a cause or causes for it to happen. And there, then there's this principle within science and philosophy of a necessary and sufficient cause. Uh, for example, okay, if I want to lift the table in front of me, I might like grab it with my right hand and, and lift it, okay? So then the cause of that, um, the table rising would be, you know, my right hand lifting it, my right arm. But let's say I'm reaching <laughs> for it with my right arm, and, but I'm also reaching for it with my left, and I, I lift it up with both arms and both hands, okay? In that case, I can no longer say that um, the right hand was the um, sufficient and necessary cause of it because the left hand was, was involved in the lifting. So it's actually a combination of these two causes, you know, that, that um, results in the table lifting. All right, so now apply this to our unconscious. Let's say my right arm and hand is our conscious mind. So it, it like, it decides, well, I'm going to, um, I'm going to decide to uh, lift this table, okay? But our left arm and hand is our unconscious. And again, we're not aware of it, but it's always active. It's always, it takes part in our every decision. And again, I'll, I'll get into it later. And, um, and even if it weren't, even if it weren't um, taking part in every single decision, we could never know you know, with any degree of certainty whether it was partici participating in, in our decision or not. So what happens is like we have this unsolicited, unconscious participation. And so like if I, you know, if my conscious mind goes to lift the table and my unconscious mind is saying, well, wait a minute, um, I'm going to like take part in this. You know, I want to like, you know, I'm going to take part in the decision to um to lift the table or in some cases it could be that like actually we're going to do a show about this in some cases our conscious mind believes that it is making the decision to, to lift the table whether with the right or left hand or whatever but it's actually the unconscious mind that's making that decision but the principle here the principle here is that um if if um if the conscious mind and the unconscious are involved in the decision to lift the table and the lifting of the table, then we can no longer say that the, the decision was free, what was freely consciously made, okay? You know, was free of the, the participation, in this case, of the unconscious, okay? And so, so that's the principle at play here. And, and again, you know, our unconscious never sleeps. And, you know, our consciousness, our conscious mind, when we're asleep, when we take a nap or something, we, um, it doesn't function. You know, what our dreams are all, are all on the level of the unconscious. I guess like they become conscious, you know, in our dreaming. But there, there's um, most of the time when we sleep, or a lot of the time at least, we're not sleep <laughs> dreaming. You know, we're, we're not in the dream state of sleep. We're in a state that, like, you know, I don't know where we are, but, that, but the unconscious is also working there. So it's working while we're asleep and while we're awake. Okay? So, now how, is, um, how does this play out um, in experiments? How do we know this? Okay? How do we know that we have an unconscious? And how do we know that, that this unconscious is actually 
in many cases, making decisions uh, for us that we think our conscious mind is, um, is making. <laughs> One way is, is through hypnosis, and particularly the, the idea of a post-hypnotic suggestion. Now, hypnosis has been around for about 150 years, I think, um, maybe a, a bit less. And the idea is that, like, you can hypnotize a person, and when they're hypnotized, give them a post-hypnotic suggestion, meaning that, like, when they wake up, um, when they're not hypnotized anymore, you can, like, have them do something, you know? And, uh, in other words, while they're hypnotized, you tell them, in this case, for example, um, all right, when the phone rings, you're going to get up from your chair, <laughs> you're going to get on your knees, <laughs> and um, take, uh, crawl a couple of steps, and look at the carpet, okay? Or, or just not even, just, just take a couple of steps, okay? So, and they've, this is like, this isn't uh, fiction, this is fact. They've done this. So what happens, um, so let, they do this, you know, they do this with a subject, they'll hypnotize a the subject, um, they'll give them the post-hypnotic suggestion that when the phone rings, the subject is going to um, get up from the chair and crawl on, on the carpet, you know. And so what happens in the actual experiment, that is what happens, you know, the, the, um, the hypnosis session is over, and you know, the, the, the subject and, um, is talking to the experimenter, to the hypnotist. The phone rings, okay? And lo and behold, <laughs> the, the, uh, the subject will get down on their knees and, and maybe crawl a little, whatever, just like, you know, fulfill the, the post-hypnotic suggestion. Now, how does re this relate to the idea of free will and, and you know, the, the unconscious mind really being this unsolicited participation in, in thoughts that we would otherwise be sure that they are, you know, our conscious, freely willed thoughts? Well, <laughs> what happens is then they ask, they ask the person, <laughs> why, um, why did you decide to um, get up from the chair and, um, or, or not just, you know, the, the last person, what are you doing, you know? And the person will say something like, oh, I'm just like admiring, I mean, the, the pattern on this carpet is so beautiful. Or, or they might say, oh, well, I don't know, I just, I felt the need to stretch some. The idea is like, they will, the, the subjects will make up, <laughs> you know, will guess, will make up a reason that they think is the real reason that they consciously chose to do that when the experimenter, and, and in fact, uh, the experimenter knows that it's because of the post-hypnotic suggestion to do that. Okay, so that's a perfect example of how the unconscious exists and, um, and is, um, is actually, in this case, completely, it's not as if it's participating in a conscious decision, it's actually making the decision for the person, okay? Um, this is like, this is an, a really intriguing kind of area in, in research. Uh, John Barge from um, B-A-R-G-H, Barg maybe, from Yale University has, has done um, experiments on this. And um, another way that, that the effect of the unconscious, the, the par participation and, and the, um, the directive role of the unconscious in our decisions has been demonstrated is through priming. Priming is, is, is similar to hypnosis, but the, the subject is completely awake. In one experiment, for example, there's two groups, the, the, subject, the, um, the subject group and then a control group. Now, the, uh, the, the, um, or the, the target group, I'm sorry. Now, the target group is, um, is asked to, um, to take some words that are given to them and, and make a sentence of them, you know. And they're given, let's say, five, six, seven words. And so, like, in, in this experiment, the target group is given the words old, um, bingo, gray, um, cane, you know. Words, may, may, maybe not old, because I don't think it's that direct, but words that connote being old, connote the idea, the concept of elderly, okay? And, um, and the, tar the, the control group is, is 
given just arbitrary words that, that don't have that connotation, have no, you know, no um, implicit connotation. Okay, so then what happens is like um, the subjects complete the test and, and you know, they think the, the experiment is over, but it's not, okay, because then <laughs> part of the experiment is they're observed walking from the experimental area to the elevator. This isn't like a high rise. Um, you know, to leave the building. They think that, you know, that, that everything is done. But they're observed walking, you know, this, this distance. And the curious thing is that um, the, the group, the target group that has been primed with words connoting elderly, walk more slowly than the, um, than the, um, the control group. Okay, so now naturally what, what that tells you is like you have, you have the group, the target group, walking. They're consciously, you know, making their decision to walk to the elevator, you know. But their unconscious mind is participating in that decision and, and how they do it, you know. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a perfect example of of the, the co collaboration that, that will take place between the unconscious mind and the conscious mind, um, completely unbeknownst to the subject, okay? The subjects, you know, aren't aware at all that that's why they're walking more slowly. Um, and again, with, as with the, the first experiment is with the, with the rug, there's another experiment that, um, that demonstrates this quite interestingly. Um, you have the same kind of, um, of scrambled word task for the two groups. And um, the, the, the target group is given words like rude and abrupt and impolite <laughs> and, you know, hasty or whatever, you know, just uh, words like that. And the, the, the other group is given words like polite, uh, respectful, patient, okay? <laughs> and so again, as with the, the other experiment, the, um, the subjects in both groups think that the experiment, they're, they're told actually, or when you're done with the task, um, go to my colleague and hand, hand them your, um, your paper, okay? So, so they do that, okay? But the colleague is, is a part, is a cohort in this experiment, and he's been instructed to be in dialogue with another person for 10 minutes. So that what happens is that the subjects in the experiment have to wait, you know, you know, to, to, to be able to like, you know, give them the paper. And, you know, naturally they, they want to wait until the uh, conversation's over so as to not interrupt. <laughs> now, okay, now what they find is that the, 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 the group, the individuals in the group that have been primed with words like rude and abrupt will interrupt the, uh, the cohort's conversation much sooner than the people who've been primed with words like polite and patient. And, and again, the, this, this second part demonstrates that, you know, these kinds of like decisions that we attribute to our free will, that we think we're, we're making completely on our own, there are decisions and they're not, you know, um, being made by anything else, this explains how that, you know, <laughs> it's, it's an illusion. Um, the, the subjects are asked, you know, well, why did you, um, why did you wait? Or why did you, um, why did you interrupt when you did? And again, the very, very curiously, the, the, the patient, the, um, the subjects will invent reasons. Um, you know, well, you know, I've always taught to, to just like, you know, wait until somebody's um, done with the conversation or, or I don't know, I just like felt that, um, you know, they'll, they'll invent, the idea is none of, none of the subjects in the group are aware. And the, the reasons for why they did that had nothing to do with the exercise before that actually primed their behavior. All right, so again, we've got a lot of experiments that demonstrate how um, the unconscious is really taking part or actually um, making the decision that we, we attribute to the, uh, um, 
to the consciousness. I, there's one more kind of experiment that I want to go into in, in great detail in another show, but it, it's, it's, um, it, it demonstrates this far more clearly. Um, the idea, oh, no, I don't have time. For, for, we've got about uh, six, uh, almost seven minutes left, and it'll take a bit too much time to describe it in the detail that, that's required. But it's, the idea is like that, um, that, yeah, neurologically, they'll hook up a person to, to imaging machines like a, an electroencephalogram or a, um, um, a MS, um, just some kind of an imaging machine and an electromyogram that measures muscle activity. And it turns out like that before the conscious mind is aware of its decision, let's say, to, to flex a finger or something, the unconscious has already made the decision, sometimes as, as soon as 10 seconds before the act, which is like amazing. Again, we'll, we'll do a show on that. But um, so, so, you know, the idea is like, so we've got this unconscious that's either taking part in whatever decisions we make, like, you know, with the, the, um, the decision to lift the table or, or the lifting, you know, of the table, the, the right hand being the conscious mind and the left being the unconscious. Or in the case of, of the experiments that I um, demonstrated, the, the unconscious mind making the, the decision completely. Okay, and the curious thing, um, what leads people to, to um, wrongly infer that, that they're making the decision completely um, free, completely free of any influence, including the unconscious, is because um, uh, by definition, by definition, the unconscious is unconscious. We, we can't be aware of it. You know, um, before Freud and others and Mesmer did their experiments with hypnosis, you know, a century and a, a bit ago, um, I don't know, maybe the Greeks may have understood the, um, that we have an unconscious, but, but in general, there was a time when there couldn't possibly be a way of knowing that we did have an unconscious. Um, but now, you know, it, it's irrefutable. We have this, um, this part of our unconscious. Actually, you know, when you think about the unconscious, think about all that's happening in your body, your heart beating, um, your organs functioning, your, your lungs breathing in and out. All this is part of the, I believe it's called the autonomic nervous system. The, the, it, it, it basically doesn't rely on our conscious um, Conscious, you know, we don't have to think about it. It just works on our own. All this is done unconsciously. So actually, that's another way of understanding, you know, the um, pervasive role that the unconscious has in not just our decisions, but our very makeup, our very biological makeup. Okay, so, um, so again, <laughs> you know, if, if we have this unconscious that is always awake, that is always active, you know, and so certainly always active because it's always like causing our organs to, to work and all, and it, it, uh, that's where all our memories and all re reside. If it's always active, uh, one, we could never claim with any degree of um, nearing, you know, certainty that, that, well, no, I made decis this decision and the unconscious was not a part of it at all. I mean, that, it would be impossible to make that claim you know, because the unconscious is always active and because we're not aware of, of it, you know. And the second part is that um, to the extent, to the extent that all our actions and thoughts are not made by the un unconscious, and again, there's, a, there's more, ev more evidence that, that that might be the case, that there actually is no conscious decision making, that all our decisions are made at the level of the unconscious, but if, if some are made, you know, at the level of consciousness, then if you have this unsolicited, this continual unsolicited, unsolicited participation of the unconscious, then obviously the, um, the decisions we make can't be freely made. Um, another way to, to understand how this unconscious participation works is um, through mood, through feelings. Like um, if, it's, if it's overcast, if it's raining, you know, we will, um, we will feel differently than if it's a, a bright, sunny, warm day, and that will lead to different decisions. That will lead to, to different, you know, um, 
to, our, to, to different acts. Um, okay. So, and now there, there are many other ways to understand how free will is impossible, why free will is impossible. But the idea behind this show is like, you know, not even considering causality, cause and effect, which is like the fundamental process in the entire universe that nothing escapes. If we don't consider that, if we don't consider imperatives like the pleasure imperative and the hedonic, the um, moral imperative, um, if we don't consider the effects of our upbringing, you know, how, what we know, what we don't know, if you just leave those or aside and just consider that we all have an unconscious that's constantly working, then you can understand how free will is impossible, you know, just by the fact that we have this unconscious and, it, and it's always working. Okay, um, now, this, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling that, um, that our entire civilization, that we as human beings, have been under this delusion, this illusion of free will for, for centuries, millennia. And, you know, the prediction, the reason I'm doing this show is that, that once, if we're fated, because it's really not up to us, if, if the causal past of the unconscious uh, determines that we're going to wake up from this, we're going to transcend this illusion of free will, that means we've got an entire, we have evolved an entirely new consciousness, an entirely new way of perceiving ourselves and our reality. And that's like, that's a huge, major step in evolution. And the reason I'm doing this show, because I predict that as we make that transition from our illusion of free will to the understanding that everything is causal, we will create a much more pleasant, compassionate, understanding, and wonderful world. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. In the future, we're going to explore other topics related to this very interesting question of the nature of human will.